Great. So um, we have about maybe five to ten minutes for questions. We'll see how it goes. So any questions for Tim or Rosemary? Yes. How was the big? How uh, how big was the gift? Well, here's the really good news. We didn't do uh, we didn't do the big fifty million dollar project, right? We did a project that was um, taking a space much like this and just blowing it out right. and redoing it. And that was about an $8 million project. Um, the gift came to us in a variety of forms, both financial gifts and also gift, gifts of materials as well. Yeah. And which we, we continue to receive um, both those kinds of support. How much cash, if I'm right? Uh, I'm actually not allowed to okay. describe that, but it was sufficient for the renovation okay. too. And uh, then once, as you know, of course, once you have the, the naming gift, then you can move forward right. and pick up additional support. And then the university also pitched in. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I will contact them with somebody in Emory. Get <laughs> additional questions? So, this is a little bit off topic, but maybe too, not too far off topic. In talking to people today, sometimes university archives and rare books are separate, and sometimes they're together. And in looking at these kinds of models, from a point of view of uh, engaging the university, can you speak to that, about that separate or together and yeah, our model that is works. together, and I think your model right. now is together, right? But ours wasn't always that way. It is that way now. I would have to say that in most cases, it's been an evolution over the last couple decades of archives, a lot of times administratively outside coming in. When I was at Duke, I actually was hired to bring the archives into part of the library. First, I brought in the library, and then I merged it with special collections. So it was, it was like a, it was a gradual baby steps of way of, of getting there. There's some, there's some real advantages to, I think, having the archives being part of a special collections library. A lot for the archives, because a lot of times, if you're like, for example, at Duke, we were sort of an orphan office reporting the presidents, and they were sort of, you know, struggling through benign neglect. Um, and so once we came to the library, we could leverage the other sources there. You know, we didn't have any experts in metadata in the university archives, but the, you know, the library did. So we were able to actually provide better access and also then really also get more engaged with sort of the, you know, with having an audience for the records beyond just those administrative offices. Also, it turns out that life isn't that easily divided. I mean, right. like Sir so, so Salman Rushdie was a member of the university community, so records and archives related to his visit would be part of the university archives, but we have his collections, you know, and our literary materials. So I think the, they naturally yeah, intersect. Yeah, I think there is more complementary overlap than sometimes people people think there will be. Because I, I think from a, a user perspective, sometimes I forget was I using archives or right. was I using mm -hmm. right. rare books at a particular mm -hmm. place. And I, I consider that a success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, consider this a theoretical question. I think it's safer this way. Um, on the one hand, you spoke of having projects to uncover little known stories in the university's past and its history. On the other hand, as a sort of a, a, an office to help the university with the celebrations and its anniversaries and everything like that. What about instances where in, there are stories that maybe universities would rather not tell? And not every university or anybody necessarily approaches it the same way, but there are complicated ones that say around the removal of statues or the renaming of buildings or um, the, the, the backgrounds of the donors or founders of the university. Have you or do you know of uh, situations where there, these have come into conflict and how do we sort of navigate those waters? I've been in both the president's office and in now in the library, and I and we have a university historian who's um, a colleague in both of those offices at the same time. And of late, I would say for the past decade, the policy has been to tell to tell the stories um, because uh, they're going to get out anyway. So why not get ahead of them and tell the story? And there was a huge scandal, you know, 20 years ago around the dental school, which no longer exists, and. Um, the dean who was claimed to be or reputed to be anti-Semitic and the research showed that in fact he was and we had we had 
that story was out. We had a reunion from the dental school, and people were able to tell their stories. And you know, it's harder when it's a little bit closer in time, right? It's not 20 years ago when it's, but you definitely lived through that. Yeah. So the well, and, um, right now I think it's interesting for. Um, the school we work for now, we forest. We always had this. We were founded by Baptist ministers, and it was always the sort of mythology there that the, oh, they were too poor to have slaves, and so they, which of course they were not. They, <laughs> all you have to do is all the really that was hiding sort of plain sight. So the University Service Studying Slavers Consortium has been a group that has been really kind of wrestling with that phony problem. But again, it's sort of that same approach is that knowing is better, and actually then we're able to you know put a you know that's you, know, you can really put a positive spin on using enslaved people to help advance your institution, but you can recognize those people that had a role and to do more so they're just not hidden in the in the sort of archival boxes and that their stories can be out there. So yeah, we have seen it more as a, um, and, uh, as a positive thing. And, and by and large, as, you know, we were concerned, particularly with Forrest, we would get sort of a negative um, um, back, back, uh, backlash from, from um, uh, alumni like that has been very minimal. Most of them have been pleased that we're actually uncovering the history. The statue thing is really much more uh, challenging um, and, and renaming of buildings, but again, archives can be really valuable because you can find out why. You know, assuming your record, you have collected the records. A lot of times, you can find out why that building or that statue was put up, uh, and it gives you the historical context for making a, a better de decision. Um, I know, like particularly in North Carolina, um, the removal of Confederate statues has been really big, and so um, very interesting thing that the University of North Carolina they have a Confederate monument on campus. Um, and they basically found out that you know, there was a, one of the university trustees who was a very active white supremacist. It was very much sort of um, uh, in that very sort of uh, you know, ugly Jim Crow era there, which is a very negative thing. And so the university you know, has tried to sort of mitigate those things. Unfortunately, the state law, because of their state institution, will not let them remove or, or, or put the statue in a different location. Um, because they have this, this monuments law that's been put into. But uh, it, it, it does help make more informed decisions. They did rename a building um, that was, uh, it was a former KK, uh, KKK uh, member had been, I uh, believe that a trustee was named for. Um, but they were able to do it and, and do a historical exhibit about the time and period there in the lobby. And again, sort of helps sort of mitigate those, that, that situation. But it does help, you know, we all have some trouble pasts in our schools. And so it, it does help us in a very informed way address those issues. So I think it actually, Make, make, will make the controversy less. Not that every institution will agree that, but if there is a controversy, archives can be a mitigating and sort of that, that good, here's the facts kind of thing, how this has happened. And so the alumni groups sometimes are the most um, difficult to deal with, and so having a close relationship with the alumni association is a good idea because then they can help you uh, work through these issues. You can have a focus group, you can have, they can help hold discussions, and. Um, and not just one point of view be heard, but um, a range of views discussed. So it's it's what a university is all about. Right. Right? I'll also say that, uh, like we're talking about administrative presentations, but students use this stuff too, and students dig things up, yeah, right. um, and you just have to be prepared for that. I yeah. think if your records are open, yeah. I think somebody's going to do campuses that got involved in that because, without a student <coughs> protest right. the launching it, we sort of got out ahead of it because of the that, um, so. So we have time for one more question. Did you still have a? Yes, it's on, on the same topic. In fact, I was thinking back of this uh, idea of being a key resource uh, in scandal and controversies, and I've been thinking of it further with litigation. So I, I, as archives, uh, we all have a role to play in democratic society. So I, and, and uh, I'm glad we're not asking that. And we currently feel the, the need in order to uh, innovating or directed on support for litigation and related research because we need to provide access sometimes to both parties while at the same time being tempted to document what is what is happening. So I would like to hear a bit more on that if you do have some kind of directive like that or um, yeah, yeah. I've actually been um been, uh, I guess I never was officially sued, just threatened to be sued. I've been subpoenaed. I've been under litigation hold. Um, everything, particularly when there's Penn State with the Sandusky scandal, could kind of uh, there with. And I've had a research room full of FBI officers. Um, so yeah, yeah um, there is that. You know, the way we have, we have Call him. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, I feel like when I was at Penn State, any kind of legal situation as an archivist you can get into, I got into. Um, so, so, yeah. I don't know if you have sort of the other. Uh, um, I would just say I have a very close relationship with the general counsel's office at Emory, and I nurture that relationship and invite them over for you know 
special opportunities to view um, letters from President Obama, and you know, just kind of make them aware of what wonderful resources we, we have and invite them to our receptions as well, but also have, you know, maintain a really strong almost weekly connection. <laughs> and I recommend that. And, the, and they become your advocates as well. And I think it's one of the things that when, when University Archives is in the library that sometimes you don't realize there is that legal piece that comes with it. And so, yeah, I agree. I've, I've known since, uh, you know, since I worked at the University of North Carolina several jobs ago, I've known the Legal Counsel's office very well because chances are when you're collecting modern records, you're going to need, you're going to need their help at some point. And they, they do appreciate a heads up if something's you know unfolding. They do appreciate you picking up the phone and letting them know and giving you some advice before it erupts. Yeah. And sometimes it's just part of the collection. Yeah, it might be when at Penn State we had the um, the archives of the United Steel Workers. Well, the United Steel Workers would have get sued for discovery over something like that. It had nothing to do with Penn State, but the records were then there, so the subpoena comes to us. So again, got very that got to be very able to have how to deal with subpoena press. press <laughs> 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 okay, so with that, we're gonna reconvene in our breakout groups. We have about 15 minutes to discuss, and then we're gonna have our last coffee break of the day. What's that?